For those um, who, who may not know it, this is what we call uh, keystoning. We've been talking about uh, uh, that uh, uh, on um, the overhead projector, and that's, uh, that's what it is. Hopefully, we will be able to eliminate that in with our, with our new um, uh, projection uh, system. And uh, also, some of the things you can see up at the top there, there's a whole lot of, of um, it's, it's um, cruddy, it's dirty, uh, and, and so forth. It's just because the machine is so old. It's uh, served us a, a long time. Of course, um, uh, it, uh, uh, Stan Ballard has had to change the oil several, time, several times and, and crank it and, and keep it going. But it's about to, to give up uh, the ghost. And so beforehand, we're going to retire it um, and give it a little dignity because it has served us well. Um, this is going to be uh, the first of, of uh, two parts, and uh, we're going to call it a dispensational comparison uh, chart. And what you have in your hands and what you see in the overhead is actually human history as God sees it. Uh, we believe that there are 7,000 years of human history, and uh, just be before we go to the conference, uh, we're working hard to present the Operation Flip-Flop, the Rapture of the Body of Christ, and so forth, so that um, uh, I can have a little practice session. You'll be uh, my guinea pigs and, and uh, the like. But uh, so that you'll do the math. And that's the exciting thing about uh, this study. Uh, it's not a conjecture. It's not an opinion. Uh, you can do the math and, uh, and figure it out uh, for yourself. But one of the uh, things that we already know as you look down the left side of this chart, is that there are seven dispensations. Now, because I want you to know the names and number uh, numbers of these things, that's why we have them here on the left. And it's important to note that we follow the Schofield numbering and names. Now, there are those who say, well, there are just four dispensations. And there are those who say, well, you'll just have three. If you're a covenant theologian, <laughs> you don't have any dispensations. It's all, it's all the same thing. Um, but we define a dispensation as a period of time where God views the world as a household. Oikonomia means house law. And he gives a specific revelation for that time. And men are judged, pro or con, dependent on their response to that revelation. And in the scriptures, you will uh, uh, see that, um, uh, perhaps not in this study, but we'll, we'll come back uh, and, and look at it, where there are seven specific revelations of God wherein uh, he utilized this over a period of time, and then he stopped it, uh, and uh, he started something else. Uh, and each of these periods uh, of, of time is unique and important and so forth. We emphasize that simply because you're living in the dispensation of grace. And I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad we are. Uh, I don't think I would want to have lived in any other dispensation. Um, uh, I don't think that I could have taken too much traveling through the wilderness for 40 years to get to the promised land uh, uh, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, in the dispensation of grace, uh, things are, are, are much better. They're much uh, easier. And the, re the, yeah, the rewards are much greater in this particular dispensation. You see, all of us, uh, the, the world has its, um, uh, has its eyes on this earth. Uh, liberal Christendom has, this, has their eyes on bringing the kingdom in this earth and being part of the earthly kingdom. I have my eyes on a quadrant of space uh, where, where it's much better and bigger and brighter and richer and fuller than anything this, this paltry little planet could afford. It's not that I don't like uh, being here. I was born here, raised here. But this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Uh, treasures are laid up someplace beyond the blue. And uh, for, the, for the kingdom saints, this earth is theirs. But for us, it's different. Anyway, that's part of the grace message. And the grace message is part of the revelation of Paul and uh, the time in which we live. So let's just uh, go over these and 
before we get to any verses of Scripture, I'm just going to make comments on each of the dispensations as uh, uh, we go. The reason we believe there are seven is that there are seven distinct revelations in the Bible wherein God started a period of time. Now the first, of course, is innocence. And uh, there are those who do not like the Schofield name innocence. But I like it because a dispensation is a period of time where man is tested. And you are what to prove and guilty? Innocent. And so man was placed on this earth in what was for him a perfect environment. Now let me just clarify something. Um, God does not call it a perfect environment. God calls it very good. The reason was Lucifer lived on this planet and he said, you were perfect in, in every way from the day you were created. Why was this earth in Adam's time not called perfect, but rather very good? Simply because this perfect angel ruined it all and God had to reconstruct it for uh, the, um, the creation of man and uh, the um, ensuing of the angelic conflict. So you have difference in terms. The original earth was perfect for Lucifer, but the, the earth then became very good for Adam. And uh, those two are two different dispensations. The angelic dispensation, wherein you have the fall of Lucifer, and the dispensation of innocence, wherein man was tested. Now, you know, under this dispensation of innocence, uh, I guess that wouldn't have been such a bad dispensation to, to live in. Think about it. You didn't ever have to worry about going to the store and what clothes you were going to wear. I mean, everybody was naked. Um, you didn't. You, you just go through the garden and, and take your pick of of, uh, of a food. Um, you didn't have to to worry necessarily about human thieves. Uh, there wasn't anybody but uh, but you and Eve there, and um, there wasn't any way to sin. Now think about this. There wasn't any way to sin but one way. And you think of the scadzillion ways that we can sin today and, and the consequences uh, of it, and realize that when Adam and Eve lived here in innocence, there's only one way to sin. You know how that was? Eat of the tree. I mean, um, they're, they're, they're just uh, simply what wasn't uh, uh, the, um, the sins and the te temptations that were uh, available at that time that are available today. Just one way, but that, that's the whole point. Could Lucifer get man to join him in his rebellion against God by um, eating of that tree which represented Lucifer's philosophy? God called it evil. And as you know, uh, man fell and is no longer in innocence. So we move from innocence uh, uh, then to the dispensation of conscience. And uh, as you can see, if you come uh, from this point to the right, we uh, believe that innocence was from creation to the fall. Now, we don't have time to do it now. It's part of uh, the uh, Operation Flip Flop study. But I will show you that the dispensation of innocence lasted 14 days. We'll show it right from the Scripture. We'll have a little drawing up here. Show it right from the Scripture, how you can discern for yourself. You, it's a, it, we draw you a picture. Discern for yourself how that it only lasted 14 days. Uh, and uh, we'll take Noah's flood, and we'll show you his time. We'll draw a comparison. We'll show you some things about uh, the Holy Spirit hovering as a dove, and the dove hovering over the waters, and, and so forth. And you'll be able to, to show that. But for our um, uh, chart here, we're just simply going to uh, uh, point to uh, the biblical places where it started and stopped, from creation to the fall. Now, you'll note two other things to the right of this, and this is why um, uh, this study is important. Because in the dispensation of innocence, there were only two Gentiles on this earth, and there weren't any Jews. And not only that, there was no written law. The Ten Commandments were not given until 2,500 years later. But now, was there a way to sin? Yes. Were there commands? Yes. 
Was there a prohibition? Yes. And the original sin was a result of not sinning against the Ten Commandments. Man is not condemned because he has sinned against any one of the Big Ten. He sinned against a prohibition about eating food uh, and, a, and a specific kind of food in the garden. He just had to have the fruit of that particular tree. And it wasn't like he didn't have everything else around about him. It just had, and that, see, he allowed the sin nature to form in him. He allowed the temptation to get the best of him. And it says when, when uh, 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 sin draws, says the book of James, and when it uh, uh, conceives, then it is a uh, uh, lust when it conceives, then it's sin. So there is no law from this point. It's not that he didn't have a law, but it was different from the Ten Commandments or the dispensation of law. All right, now, so let's move to, um, to the second one here. The next thing is the dispensation of conscience. Now, in each um, of these, there are special conditions. Adam had a sacrifice uh, made for him in the garden. And God set a precedent there. Adam, therefore, was to tell his, um, his uh, progeny from that point onward what they were, do, were to do to have a relationship with the Lord. So that became the, the sticking point, that became the issue. And so we have chapter 4 opening up with us uh, in uh, the scriptures, and we have Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam. And it says that Abel brought of the flock a blood sacrifice. That's what God required. Who told him to do that? Adam did. Because that's what God used to save Adam's uh, soul and to clothe him. But now we have Cain. And what does he bring? Bloodless sacrifices. Uh, the works of his own hands. Uh, a religious concoction. Well, I don't need to offer blood. I'll just do good works and God will uh, approve of me. And God said to him, if you do well, this is an appeal to his conscience. If you do well, won't you be accepted? Now, during that time, uh, there was, again, there were no uh, Gentile nations, uh, excuse me, no Jews, rather. Uh, there were only Gentile nations, and they were without a written law. But was Cain breaking a law? Yes, the one God had established with regard to approach. How do you approach me? Through the blood. And so man was saved according to the, the appeal to his conscience. Um, in fact, let's just look at a, a verse of scripture that, that sheds light on that. Turn to the book of Romans, holding your place there in, in um, Genesis. Chapter 2. Verse number 12. For as many as have sinned without the law, shall also perish without the law. As many as have sinned in the law, shall be judged by the law. Not the hearers of the law just before God, but the doers shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, and is speaking of this time here, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. How? It shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile, excusing or uh, accusing one another. Okay, we can go back to, to Genesis again. We'll be back there in, in just a little bit. So uh, how did God appeal to people to be saved? Their conscience. Uh, though they didn't have a written law externally, they did have one internally. Now what did Cain do to, um, to get out uh, from under the burden of a pricked conscience. He, he killed his brother. Uh, his brother hurt him because his brother was doing it the right way. And if my brother's out of the way, rather than just doing it right, if my brother's out of the way, then my conscience will not uh, be hurt. And of course, uh, he murdered his, uh, his um, uh, brother. So 
What did Noah appeal to? Conscience. Because people were breaking natural laws. We have the dispensation of innocence where God recreated the earth and uh, he did so so that they were to reproduce after their kind. We have that in the first few chapters of Genesis. After their kind, they're to reproduce. So you come now into the dispensation of conscience and what, uh, what do you have? Angels with humans and angels uh, and humans produce Nephilim and then you have angels, humans and Nephilim cohabiting and then you finally get where the animals too uh, were uh, genetically um, corrupted and uh, so you have from the fall to the flood. Now God is going to preserve the Gentile world. Uh, so he has Noah and the ark and uh, they come through on the other side and Noah's three sons repopulate uh, the earth. That moves us then into the next one, the dispensation of human government. Now, uh, here's a, a good one. Pastor Stam says that human government as a dispensation continues on. We do not believe that. Human government had its end at the Tower of Babel. Uh, what perhaps he doesn't see and what we believe is that human government was a means of being saved or restraining the old sin nature. Because it's in human government where God says, if a man kills another man, another man who is, uh, who is right and just will take the life of the murderer. Because in the image of God made he man. Uh, and also, uh, at, during the, the dispensation of human government, he says we can eat the animals. Evidently, uh, during the dispensation of conscience, you have with the corruption of the, of the animals there that uh, the animals were beginning to eat people and consume them. It says violence uh, was predominant on the face of the earth. So God correct, uh, corrects the whole situation and says to man, under the dispensation of human government, you now can eat the animals. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a reason for this as well. Animals have a stronger strain of protein than mere uh, uh, vegetables, herbs, and fruits. Now, why? what happened at this time to have God to cause men to eat animal meat? During of his recreation, and we have seen this in the, in the second day of creation, God separated the waters from the waters, and he had a canopy over the earth. It was a fantastically thick canopy where the sunlight would come through, but it was filtered in such a way uh, so that there was uh, nothing detrimental to man's health, and so that the, um, the uh, vegetation would grow in a very lush and massive uh, fashion. Uh, talk about a green earth, it was green at that particular time. But after the flood, guess what happened? He opened the windows of heaven, and much of that water came on earth for the flood, and it was never replaced. We do not have the same canopy over us as Noah and, and his sons. And therefore, the lifespan got shorter, and man was told, you need to have a little bit stronger, uh, something's going to be, excuse the phrase, uh, stick to your ribs. And so from this point, he established human government, and uh, he allowed men to eat the animals. But he al also allowed men to legitimately kill other men for murder. This is when it started. But what did he say as his reason for doing this? Because in the image of God created he them. And any murderer takes the life of another man, not just because of his own passion and rage and jealousy and greed, but because that man is in the image of, of, um, of God uh, and, um, uh, and has the potential of restoring that uh, image. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, we're here in human government. And human government was a way wherein people could be saved. You say, oh, Pastor, wait one second. Human government sa saving, yes. This is where you really begin the, pro the, uh, the uh, procedure of household salvation. It's under the dispensation of human government. For example, a father, Noah, had sons living around him, 
and he said, this is, uh, this is the true God, and this is the one we're going to worship. It's through Noah that he transferred this to Shem. From Shem we have Abraham, and, and so forth. And all of those men represent households. Uh, but we don't have household salvation today as you did back at, at that particular time. And this is when it started. And it was a predecessor to the next um, uh, dispensations that we are going to have coming up. So human government went from the flood to Babel. But again, we'll look in the scriptures eventually and we'll see that there were no Jews. There were only Gentiles. And if you come over to, to this side, the relation to the law. There were laws on the books, but the Ten Commandments were not yet given. All right, so we move in to this point. Significance. At the Tower of Babel, what group per se did God give up? Gentiles. <laughs> So you've got a play, point in history where he said to us as Gentiles, you know, okay, I can't get through to you. Uh, uh, this has gone on long enough, all these thousands of years to this point. Um, I've kind of had it up to here, says God. I'm going to scatter you across the face of the earth. And from this point on, we now have, uh, and I've got it in, in brown here, the choice of the father of his earthly people. We now have Abraham, who was called a Hebrew. And the word Hebrew means that he's crossed over. Uh, so um, there, is a, there is a transition here from Abraham the, uh, Abram the Gentile to Abraham the Jew. And this is when it started. And we have a dispensation that, that goes 430 years from Abraham to Moses. And uh, there's a whole lot about this particular dispensation that is, um, that is similar to ours. For example, who does Paul use uh, as an illustration of our own salvation? Abraham, Romans chapter 4. Well, what did Abraham do that, that we do today? He just simply believed God and it was uh, granted to him, uh, counted to him for righteousness. Did I, did I knock that off that idea of it? So, in the, in the fourth dis dispensation, we have promise. Now, the promise is actually the Abrahamic covenant. That through him, all the world would be blessed. Now, often when we look at that, it, it talks about the blessing of the land. It talks uh, later on about the blessing of the seed. Uh, and about uh, the kingdom, and the throne, and so forth. But what really was the blessing that God promised to Abraham? Eternal life. Uh, that through him, that all the world would be blessed. In other words, through him and his son, Jesus Christ, uh, the offer of eternal life could be legitimately made. And that was the, that was the promise, and that was the blessing. Eternal life. You see, it's no good to have an eternal land unless you've got eternal life. It's no good to have an eternal house unless you've got eternal life. It's no good to have an eternal throne and government unless you have eternal life. And so the, the very foundation, uh, ground zero, bottom line of the Abrahamic covenant was this promise that in him would all nations be blessed, offered eternal life through faith in Christ. And so that came at this dispensation, and so much of it um, uh, uh, can be used as an illustration for us until you get to chapter 17 of, uh, of um, Genesis, where God established circumcision. From that point on, uh, you do not have uh, a similarity to the dispensation of grace, because God is beginning to, um, to genetically, and that's what circumcision was, it was to genetically identify his people through a fourfold genetic link. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and one of the twelve. And Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. Uh, and um, uh, all of this is, is, uh, is part of it. But now, if you move over here, you'll note something about this. Now we have... God dealing with the Jewish nation apart from the Gentiles. What happened? 
he gave them up here. Uh, holding your place in Genesis 9. <laughs> let's, let's go back. I should have just had you do this to begin with. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I really was just going to talk, but I think we'll show a couple of scriptures. And the next time, part two here, we'll get into many more scriptures. But some of the folks that we have here are new to these things. The, the names, the numbers, the gist of them, what happened, why it's significant, and the like. Note, verse 11. For, for uh, several thousand years you had Gentiles and no Jews. Now you have God putting away the Gentiles and focusing in on one nation, Israel. Verse 11 of Ephesians uh, 2. Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. You were without a Messiah, in other words, without a Savior, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The only way Gentiles had a shot at salvation was to be associated with this nation. You see the grandeur of the dispensation of grace? We don't have to have a Jew lead us to Christ. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we lead them to Christ through Paul's gospel, which is a Gentile gospel. Uh, you're you're um, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no hope. Uh, and we're without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Okay? Uh, let's go back and to uh, Genesis there and just hold your place. So God begins working on the dispensation of promise, developing the foundational uh, men who would be involved in starting this Jewish nation. Then you come to uh, the fifth um, dispensation. By the way, uh, even these numbers uh, are somewhat relative. Um, the dispensation of grace as we have it in history is six. It is indeed man's dispensation because that's man's number, you see. Uh, Paul calls this the present evil age, uh, where men have gotten rid of Jesus Christ. Is he on this earth? No, he's in exile at the, in, the, in the third heaven. He's not on the, this planet. Men have taken over this planet, and God's will is done through this mystery program. Uh, rather than, than the, uh, the promise that he made to the children of Israel. So it's man's dispensation. However, if you count its number from the fall, it's the fifth dispensation, and fifth is the number of grace. So from the fall, it's the fifth dispensation, which means that it is uh, the dispensation that shows the grace of God to fallen men better and greater than any of the other dispensations. And, uh, and uh, you can do that uh, uh, back and forth, which is not our purpose uh, tonight, but uh, showing how from this point to this point, the number of the dispensation can, can mean this and the other. And the, one of the most outstanding is, uh, is simply this one. It is fifth from the fall, uh, and it magnifies five is the number of grace, the grace of God more than anything. But from the beginning, it is the sixth because uh, it is also the dispensation wherein men, Gentiles in general, have charge of, of, this, of this planet, and Christ is going to have to come back and reclaim it. Um, anyway, where are we? We're five here. The reason that the law is five is because we now have God doing something historically that's simply an act of His grace, that was not done. What is that? To establish a nation wherein he can live among men and govern them by being living with them. And that is an act of grace. There is always grace in dispensation. So you now have the law given. And you'll note as we go to, to the right here, 
It's, uh, we call it the dispensation of law because the Bible does. It goes from Moses to Paul. Again, it deals basically with the Jewish nation apart from the Gentiles. Now here's the change here historically. All this time there was no written law, no written revelation. None of these people had a Bible that they could turn to. You know, turn to Genesis 5, you know, something, and, and uh, we're going to exegete this pa passage of Scripture, and we're going to see what it's... They didn't have it. It was just simply verbal communication all the way down. Preserved, mind you, but it was still verbal. From man to man, generation to generation, family to family. No written revelation until you get here. And what does God give? He gives the history through here in the very first book of the Bible. And then the, very, the second book of the Bible, it tells us about the law. The most stringent um, economy that history has ever seen is the dispensation of law where thou shalt not this, and thou shalt not the other, and, and so forth. And if thou shalt, you're going to get stoned or burned or something. And it is a very stringent dispensation. But by the way, it is the dispensation under which Jesus Christ was born, raised, and lived, and he did it perfectly. He fulfilled the law. Why? So that Christ could become the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. Now, the end of the law there is not the end of the dispensation of law, but the end of its condemnation. He has become the end of the condemnation of the law for those who believe. The dispensation of law did not end or wasn't postponed until Paul. It did not stop at the cross. But we get those benefits. Okay, let me see our time here. Let's, uh, let's move on. Now we come to the sixth dispensation, and this is called grace. Significance? You're living in grace right now. You know how you got saved? Not because God made you a covenant promise. Not because you lived under the Jewish economy of law. Not because you kept the Ten Commandments. But because God said... My son has died for you. He fulfilled the law on your behalf. Believe on him and you're saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, gift of God, lest any man should boast. And so this dispensation is actually called grace. And by the way, we will see, and especially in the Operation Flip-Flop, where the dispensations are actually named in, in the Bible. Uh, dispensation of promise is named. Dispensation of law is named. The dispensation of grace, Ephesians chapter 3. It says, uh, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given to me for you Gentiles. I mean, obviously, these are dispensations where a specific revelation uh, was given. Uh, so that um, it can be said that these are under law. But if we go back to dispensation five and try to fulfill what they did back then, are we right or wrong? We're wrong. We're not under the law. That dispensation. Why? Because there's been an updated revelation which supersedes and eliminates much of, of what is uh, told under law, except by way of principle and, and some other things that Paul incorporates. But aside from those things, we're not under law. Um, if, uh, if we were under law, we would have to go to Jerusalem. We'd have to go to the temple, have to be a priesthood, have to keep all those feasts we studied about. Uh, you'd have to bring your sacrifice. Uh, on and on we could go. Um, you'd, uh, you'd have to be baptized, but, but not just uh, uh, one time. Israel had umpteen washings. Uh, you had to wash your hands. You had to wash your feet. Uh, you have to wash your utensils and, and, and so forth. Uh, you heard the stories of those about uh, the holy days, getting different dishes out because they could not have uh, the um, uh, leaven touch. We live in the dispensation of grace. We eat leaven all the time. On Easter we eat leaven, and it doesn't matter. Uh, excuse me, Resurrection Sunday. We eat uh, leaven. Doesn't, doesn't matter. So this dispensation extends from Paul, who received the revelation, to the rapture. Now, the rapture is his special uh, doctrine. We call this mystery doctrine because the dispensation is also called not just grace, 
but the dispensation of the mystery. It was something hid in God that we could go from Adam to, to this point no one else knew. You know, you know something that David does not know. You know something that Abraham never knew. You know something that Moses did not know. What is it? That God had a secret purpose to populate the second heaven with a group of people called the body of Christ who would be in, in spirit baptism so united to Christ that the uh, identities merge and blend so that he can now uh, not be identified apart from his body and we cannot be identified apart from him. We are united together so that Paul says, not just have we been baptized into his body and spirit, but you're the body of Christ and members in particular. This is a dispensation in which uh, we live. Uh, and if I had my brothers between Israel and the church, guess where I'd rather be? In the body of Christ. Now, here then uh, is where we have all nations on an equal footing. Uh, hold your place here and let's, um, let's go back to Romans chapter 16. I don't know why we didn't do that to, to begin with. Instead of sliced Bible study we have, <laughs> we wrench the loaf. We will get to this in, in the, the next hour when we consider this in, in part number two. But um, in Romans chapter 16, now to him that is of power, verse 25, to establish you according to my gospel, it's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And note what for. Last part of verse 26. According to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now that all nations includes the nation of Israel, but, but it's on an equal footing with the Gentiles. He lumped all the nations together, and we all follow the one uh, Apostle Paul, so that if a Jew gets saved, it's by a Gentile gospel, following the Gentile Apostle, uh, and so forth. But it's because he's placed us all on an equal footing. It wasn't so in, um, in the, the dispensation past. It was the, the Jew first. Uh, sometimes it's the Jew only. Uh, but uh, the Jew took the forefront in, these, uh, in this particular dispensation. But now in... The time in which we live, God says, all nations can be saved, be established in the faith on an equal uh, footing. No one takes precedence, no one group, race, uh, genetic pool takes precedence over another. And uh, we will see the scripture where it says, we are under grace. They are under law, we are under grace. And we're just about out of time, so let's consider the, the seventh kingdom, or, or the seventh dispensation called the kingdom. And by the way, this one is named as well in the scripture. What revelation do they have? Well, Jesus Christ comes back and it says that the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as uh, the waters are in the sea. And so the revelation is that Jesus Christ comes back and he rules and reigns with a rod of iron. He's uh, the uh, preeminent Bible teacher during this particular time. He sets it up and men live under different conditions. He is on the throne. Um, he is calling the shots. The curse is removed. People have to come uh, to Jerusalem and make that pilgrimage and so forth. And things are different. It extends um, actually from his coronation to the white throne, but uh, following the rapture, you have the tribulation period uh, all the way then through to the uh, white throne. Basically, it's a thousand years, but these are the time periods in history. Who does it involve Israel and the nations and the law is placed within? Let's look at one, one more portion of scripture in Isaiah. And during part two, you'll know exactly where to open your Bible. <laughs> Isaiah chapter two.
perhaps that would have been uh, the greater part of wisdom is to just to trace this this part through that's what we did anyway it started here with Gentile nations with no Jews and we saw that it was the Jewish nation without uh, uh, the Gentiles or apart from them here it's all nations equally and then the kingdom is going to have Israel and the nations chapter 2 what Isaiah saw verse number 1 concerning Judah and Jerusalem come to, uh, come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains uh, that is the Lord's going to be king of the hill he'll be exalted above the hills the other nations and note all nations shall flow into it uh, Israel is the preeminent nation uh, head over the tail uh, and so forth verse number three many people shall come and say let's go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob he will teach us his ways we'll walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations rebuke many people uh, and so forth so that nation does not rise up against nation and they learn war no more and then next time we'll learn that the law is within and that's how, how we'll trace it this whole time they are without the law now you are under the law then you become under grace and finally God then places the law within the hearts of people in the, the kingdom age